Okay, welcome everybody. Today is February the 1st, and this is our episode for Mahogany Thoughts. This is the 29th episode. Going off the top of my head, I didn't get a chance to look at it earlier. But anyways, I'm Dr. Terrence Duncan, and I'm with my co-host and partner in crime, Queen Karma Brown. What it do hey, in 22? Hey, hey. hey, everyone. Yeah. 2022, what it do? What it Here do, what it do. Back Absolutely. At it back at it again so uh butler is not able to uh be on this particular podcast but he's still a member of the show he will be on the show in a couple of weeks we're actually going to do something um to honor black history month and we're going to talk about black wall street so that would be on the that the, 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 was two weeks from now the 15th no, it'll be on 22nd. Actually, it'll be three weeks from now. We'll do a, another, the next podcast will be on February 22nd, and we're going to talk about Black Wall Street. We're going to talk about it from a historical significance, and then we're going to talk about, you know, current implications, lessons learned, and building a path for the future. But before we do that, um, we are going to talk about something that I thought was a really interesting article, and we're just going to focus on that today. And what is generational wealth? You know, I know we've talked about it on a couple of um, a podcast before but I, I read an article that i thought was really interesting and um uh, let's see if i can try to pull it up but yeah i read an article that was really interesting and uh, i just stumbled on it because i'm always an avid reader i don't read books that much but i do read a lot of articles and this article was by a brother named bricks and diamond uh, it was written for black blavity b-l-a-v-i-t-y was it blavity blavity so uh, the title of the article was how black americans are missing out on the largest wealth transfer in history and i thought it was a really good opinion piece because of the fact that um the difference you know the racial wealth disparity gaps we talk about generational wealth but we don't understand really what generational wealth entails just based by the research and as well as the uh the process of uh asset accumulation but in an article the brother writes that as a 20 21, black households still only have a mere 12 cents for every dollar of a typical white household. And he also talks about estate planning and a real uh, sober, in fact, is that, um, you know, he states, and I quote, we are potentially missing out on the largest wealth transfer in history. Over $68 trillion million in money and assets are at stake. And, out, and three out of four black Americans are unprepared. And so, you know, I reached out to Carmel and uh, Butler and just talked about that, you know, the implications for that. And so that's going to be the scope of our, our article. So, you know, Queen Carmel, when you're hearing about, you know, how ill prepared we are and, you know, we're, you know, first things first, we are making strides. So this is not to say that, you know, we're totally going to reverse, but our, our growth is very slow. It's very, uh, it's like a turtle pace in some ways. And this really underscores that. So you're seeing more Blacks becoming degreed. You're seeing more Blacks getting, you know, you know, better paying jobs, better positions, just starting businesses. But, you know, by the end of the day, three out of four, that's 75% of Black Americans are not prepared for death. And so um, we talk about death and we talk about our faith um, as far as religion is concerned and believe that um, that if we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, um, that we should have everlasting life. And that is a, an intangible concept. You know, none of us has seen Jesus in the flesh and we've never seen heaven in the flesh. And but the thing is, um, wills and powers of attorney and death is tangible and it's real and so it's really, really interesting how we as black americans look at you know faith and salvation but then when it comes to ensuring what our future looks like uh i mean karma like i said i mean what do you think about just the facts is provided right there i mean it's it's overwhelming when you think about the numbers and uh and you know i don't know you'll talk a lot about why the circumstances exist and what we can do about it. But I agree with you, we are making strides. Things are headed in the right direction and it is certainly in a slower pace than we would like to see. But um, you know, that's something that uh, I think is a result of lack of education historically. And uh, we're doing better with that as well, which is why we're seeing those numbers increase and improve a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, the stuff is like, I know a lot of times we talk about businesses, but how can you thoughts is more than just, you know, about business growth and whatnot. I mean, this is what we do. We talk a lot about entrepreneurship. We do business consulting and coaching, teaching, you know, things of that nature, but it still comes down to the household. It comes down to whether you're a single parent, if you're married, um, if you're in a blended family, it doesn't really matter. You know, black is black. And so, you know, these are the themes, you know, I was explaining to somebody earlier today 
uh, here at uh, Cafe 618 Biz um, that it's really important that we, you know, not just focus on the business level, but that we cover all compasses of Black life, you know, um, and our guests and, and, and the people who do participate doesn't necessarily have to be Black, but, you know, depending on how we can, you know, procure the, the, the guest speakers. But by the end of the day, uh, we have a moral obligation to make sure that we're speaking about, you know, issues that really affect us and even issues that we don't consciously think about. And this is one of those topics that we don't consciously think about at the end of life. So, you know, for all the glamas and, and pop pops out there, you know, have you really thought about what are you leaving your children? We spent, you know, it's not saying we don't love our children. You know, we love our children. Um, I don't have any grandchildren as of yet, and hopefully that won't be happening for quite some time. But, you know, when I do become um, whatever that name's going to be, you know, I'm a love of my grandchildren, just like I love my kids, but you know, it, it's what I'm going to do for, for them. And, you know, and just yeah, out of curiosity, I mean, Carmel, have, have you and Rodney, have y'all even thought about doing that or have you already, you know, started the will process or, you know, things of that nature? I know you don't have any grandkids, but no, I was gonna say, no. <laughs> let me clear that up for the record. We're like, not ready. Has, yeah. Yeah. And there's no surprises, Rodney. No. <laughs> Well, you know, so several years back, we purchased, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Susie Orman. Um, yeah, we, you know, purchased some of her products over the years and, you know, started some of that stuff, um, you know, in the past, we definitely need to do some updating. It's been quite some time, so definitely need to revisit, but, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. I started reading uh, some of her books and getting interested in some of uh, the other financial uh, experts and, you know, people that talk about investment and retirement and all those things back in, I would say probably about 12, 13 years ago. And, um, and I, I realized the importance of it then, but even now, like I said, it's, it's been so much time that's passed and we just haven't talked about it as much as we need to with regards to even revisiting. And I just think that's a problem that we all probably have faced at some point. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so for for our household, we actually have a will power of attorney. And actually, um, I touched on this, I believe it may have been last year, early last year, it was because of the coronavirus. You know, that was when the first time that, you know, experienced mortality, you know, right, right in your face and stuff. I mean, you know, at the time it was like 43, 44, when I had my first will. And, um, you know, I had life insurance, you know, I had adequate coverage, but, you know, it was one of the first times you have to ask yourself that question, like, well, what are you going to do for your kids? And so um, I do have a power of attorney. Um, I have a, a financial power of attorney. I have a will and have a dual. I have a, uh, a DNR, mm -hmm. I believe is. Yeah, I, I have a medical power of attorney, you know, basically do not resuscitate. And so. Um, you know, those things are important because, you know, especially for those who are large families, blended families, whatever the case may be, if your loved one happens to unfortunately catch coronavirus or some other serious uh, medical event that requires hospitalization, if they're not able to, um, let me see if I get this right, if you are not able to be uh, alert and oriented times three, um, and I forgot what those categories are off the top of my head, then uh, somebody has to make that decision. And so often what happens is you get into these little cat fights about who, you know, what's best for big mama or, or, or for your pops or for your brother, whoever, and, you know, establishing a power of attorney um, or your, uh, your medical, your advanced directives, that's what it's called, your advanced directives, you know, that's really important because, it, you know, while you are alert and while you have a sound mind, it's very important to dictate, you know, if these, if something did happen to me, what should happen? Same thing about burial, you know, um, you know, where do you want to get buried? Do you want to get buried? Do you want to get cremated? You know, it's more than just saying, you know, well, I told my son or told my daughter, you have to capture that. And, uh, and it's very important to do something to that effect. You know, additionally, when it comes to um, having a state or a will, um, you know, most people feel like that you have to have a house. And even though we will talk about home ownership later on throughout the year through a series of programming, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a house to have a will, you know, because it could be something as simple as having a car. Who do you want your car to go to? Um, you know, what about your, 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 your assets, you know, even if I properties, let's say that Carmel, you had some really nice 
exquisite figurines from your travel and your, you know, the collector's items or whatnot and stuff. And what happens with that? You know, what happens if your child looks and the children looks at it like, well, you want to keep it or mom wants to sell it? You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you might think those things are trivial and stuff, but at times not having an established policy or, or an, an, an established directive can really affect the dynamics of your household. Agreed. So, um, you know, by the end of the day, it's really important to really assess, you know, not so much of where we are today, but, you know, like I said, just accept the reality that we are going to die. And there's really nothing to do about it. Um, but what we can do on this earth really makes a difference. And that's how to, you uh, secure generational wealth. Um, I actually, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'm glad that you mentioned. Uh, the small or minimal things that are important to not look over because very often people think that uh, if they don't have a lot of money or a lot of assets that they don't need these documents and that certainly is not the truth so I'm glad that you pointed those things out. Yes and in, you know because I think the same thing even with financial advisors and I, I don't know if you guys remember the uh, the episode when we had Marcus Creighton on board who was a who was a financial advisor um you know you don't really need to have you know hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to have a financial advisor you can have a financial advisor is rapidly i mean as soon as you're able to open an account depending on who your broker is in the institution um you know you know there are experts and i know that we're kind of wary of you know giving our money to other people and making decisions for us you know or trying to help guide our decisions but the thing is is that you know we have to accept the reality just like if i come to you as a therapist or anybody in your practice for therapy you know i may know some things about mental health and i might know some things about self-care and stuff but when it comes to uh strategies uh depending on whatever i have going on or if i have a diagnosis that have, I'm not even aware of, um, you know, you are the expert of that. And it's hard for me to refute, you know, what that expert opinion is. Um, so it, it's, you know, again, it, it's while we're, if we're addressing one area, it's really important for us to address, you know, all the areas the best way that we can. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So I want to just read this excerpt, excerpt from my book, um, The Mahogany Legacy Project. Y'all need to get that book. And it talks about, and I'm just going to read directly from the book. And it says, Homeownership is often discussed as the primary driver of wealth accumulation for various reasons, which are accurate. However, generation wealth is a multi-tiered approach of accumulating a physical asset, such as a house, and combining it with other appreciated assets that can be transferable through various legal mechanisms, such as a trust, will, or having assets tied into a state. In addition, various assets are available for savings and investing so that net worth and equity may grow over time rather than a quicker and riskier path some are often willing to take to become rich or attain wealth overnight. So when you hear that, Queen Carmel, your thoughts? You know, I, I think those are very solid points and um, actually the most critical points uh, when it comes to helping people understand what this whole thing entails or at least the foundation of it. Um, you said a lot in that one excerpt from your book. So, you know, I think that when we talk about generational wealth um, as a society in general, definitely in the Black community, we think that real estate and, um, and for some people, they think, you know, their retirement 401k and things like that, they're, they're looking at things like that. And there are some things that, that they tend to leave out. And so personally, starting a business that is one way to create generational wealth as well. You know, things, these are things you can hand down to future generations and hopefully things that the next generation can pass on to the generation behind them and so on and so forth. But yeah, real estate, of course, that's when we say real estate, you know, it's not just the home that you live in, you know, <laughs> because our, our homes, they do depreciate over time, yes. mostly, you know, but, um, you know, I know, uh, you know, Dr. Duncan, you're interested in um, you kind of been dibbling and dabbling in uh, real estate investment and it's it's a it's a big deal and it's a great way to uh, pass on some generational wealth but um, you, you know like you said the wills and the estate planning and all those things are certainly critical and um, no I think that that's that's a really great you should probably make a copy of that part of your book you and probably post it on the Facebook page 
I think I will. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but you know what, though? That is true, though. Yes, I will go ahead and post that. So thank you for the suggestion, because I definitely need a social media manager, because my social media game, as I said over and over again, is horrible. But, you know, yes, you can't start a business is one way to uh, build generational wealth. But one thing is for all those who listen, who are business owners, you got to have a continuity plan. And so, you know, the thing is, is that if you're a single member LLC, if you're a sole proprietor, if you die, that's it. So unless you have something established, again, that's where you need business planning. Um, you, you know, if you pass, mm -hmm. or and if, whether you're single, or you know, if you're married, and you and both of you guys pass, it, it's, it's not automatic that the, you know, whatever's left behind, the survivorship goes directly to and adulterated to your children or next of kin. Um, your business there is a, will die with you. Your business will more likely die with you. So even as I'm continuing to do things for real estate, and even if I'm even as I'm continuing to do things on a on the um, entrepreneur side, and even from the income income and the asset accumulation side, I have to continue to reevaluate. And I know you've talked about with through the Susie Orman. Uh, situation, you know, a good time for those who are listening, who do have a will, you know, make sure you check it every year. You know, it doesn't have to be updated every year, but you should be able to check it regularly to see, is it reflective of your current situation and your current wishes? Um, you know, because it, you know, what, what you don't want to have is a will that's, you know, relatively outdated. So like you said, you got at one house and you probably had ten thousand dollars in your savings account or whatever and uh or ten thousand in retirement and, and then you look at it 10 years later you're up to like a half a million dollars in retirement you got a couple of properties you know if you don't if you don't have any directors on that or take the steps to legally protect what's yours to make sure it passed down for generation to generation there's this nice little sexy two words called probate no, it's a state tax. It's a state tax. The other sexy word is called probate. And those are things that, you know, um, for those who are not familiar with it, they can eat up a large chunk of your money. And also, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a legal expert on this, but I have, you know, read up on it, studied on it, and, you know, spoke with people who have countered situations. When you get dragged to probate um, and fighting over your estate, it is very costly and it's very expensive. And even so, and, and really, when you think about it, you're playing against the stack debt because you're not going to you're not going to go through the process quickly if you don't have your 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 protection, you know, including having money for you know, you know legal fees and things like that to fight for your estate. So then what happens is because we don't have good estate planning and things like that, and we can make an argument if it's systemic or institutional racism or whatever, it's pretty that part's pretty relevant. But what is relevant is that we do have an obligation to make sure that we protect that because um you could inadvertently lose your property, you know, because you ran out of money to defend your property or your family's property. And that is a reality. And, you know, historically through black families uh, across the country, not just specific in the St. Louis region, um, but, you know, that's how some real estate people make their money is, you know, through our ignorance. And so if we're talking about generational wealth and building the block and reestablishing black communities, we have to make sure we protect those assets because some of those properties, regardless of where they are in the community, um, you know, you have people who were able to catch them on tax liens because, you know, some of the family members may not even want to be bothered with the with the fight and they just may, may relinquish the property and then somebody buys it, rehabs it, fixes it up, and either they get the rental income or they sell it for a significant profit, you know, and that has happened uh, historically for, for generations. And so, as we continue to build homes, as we continue to buy homes, as, as we continue to buy duplexes um, or whatever little habitat that you're trying to buy, um, by the end of the day, we have to make sure that, you know, those assets are protected. So how are you able to do so? Um, you know, there are a variety of services that you can do on your own, believe it or not. Uh, you can actually go on Amazon and download a will maker. Um, if you don't have a complex situation, you can buy a will maker and they'll ask you a series of questions, you know, such as your personal information. Uh, they even have something for your, your accounts because now since we're such, using such technology, um, you know, this happened to my dad when my dad passed, nobody didn't know exact his account information. And that was a, that was a, almost like an Indiana Jones experience, just trying to figure out what his passwords were to get into all of his accounts. And, um, you know, so that was in 90 or 2017. So in 2022, I mean, shoot, I know for me, I probably got about 70 different accounts, you know, but I have a master list and it's stored on 
is very safe place. And so the two people who knows if anything happens to me where to access it, they can access it. And one of them is my youngest child. You know, so that is my, you know, so I have to think of in the life because I do have different, you know, business uh, interests and whatnot. So um, what are your thoughts? Um, no, I, I think that that's very, very valuable information. I appreciate you for sharing that. And, you know, hey, it is what it is. You know, this yep. is tough stuff to talk about. You know, a lot of people, um, like I said earlier, have had a lot of uh, misinformation about what needs to happen in preparation for end of life. You know, if you really think about the Black community, I know for most of us, we were taught to work for, you know, your job for 30 years. <laughs> You get your retirement and benefits and you save money in your bank account. So your savings account and your retirement, those are the most important things that, well, those, that's what was discussed with us. You know, we didn't grow up a lot of us hearing about estate planning and, and, and trusts and, and all of that and, and investing in real estate. Uh, most of us did not, you know, that's not the case for everyone, but those were just topics that we just didn't hear a lot about, about stocks and investing and so, so, and unfortunately for some people, even life insurance. Now, you know, I, I'm very grateful for having growing up, grown up in a house in which that those things were discussed, especially things like life insurance. Sure. I remember hearing my mom sitting down um, in the living room with this guy. I think his name was, uh, <laughs> I can't even remember his name, but he used to come in and they literally would talk about like plan out plots and, and, you know, <laughs> buy all the sheep, you know, bought basically plots for everyone, life insurance for everyone. So that basically she knew who, where everybody was going to be buried, who was oh, going to wow. be buried, where she had life insurance for everybody, even on into our adult years, you know, all that stuff was still in place. So, you know, she was really good about those types of things. And we're talking about what we should leave for future generations with regards to passing on generational wealth. We also have to speak to what we should not leave for our future generations, such as debt. Yes, yes, because <laughs> it is true. You can't take your debt with you, but you can leave your debt to your children. So, um, you know, again, you know, and the thing is about being a parent, and I think all of us agree and stuff, once they leave the nest, I have a 21 year old in the Air Force and um, he's trying to buy a car and you know, I've talking to my son maybe more times in the last three weeks than I did probably in the last seven months combined, um, including the time I spent with him during the holidays. And, uh, you know, you never stop being a parent, you know? And, and so, I mean, I know that it's our desire for them to kind of, you know, leave the nest, uh, you know, uh, have their own place, start their own family, or, you know, just live their own life. But, you know, by the end of the day and stuff, they're still your children. And we still have a responsibility to make sure that we look out for them. And just that little small little times, like you said, with your mom, you know, I think that's really cool that she did that, you know, because, um, you know, they understand, y'all understand, you know, what she was doing and why. I mean, you guys, as you got an order, you can equate your situation to what you saw and what you remember from, you know, like really, you know, back in the day. So I think that's really dope. So, um, you know, but like I said, I know that we're very business oriented the majority of the time, but it doesn't matter about your situation. You know, if you do have, <clears throat> tell me, if you do have life insurance, please consider getting this, uh, at least a will. You know, I know that getting an estate and a trust is, you know, could be considered expensive, you know, but if you look at what you're investing, which often is, I believe, like maybe two to three thousand dollars, your investment of two and three thousand dollars for that legal expert to draw up their contracts, if that's what you want to do, would save your children potentially tens of thousands of dollars, um, depending on your situation. I know that if anything happened to this particular household and your particular household, that bill is not going to be cheap, you know. Um, and so, you know, you have to look at the cost of doing business and is it really worth it? So, yeah, you know, at this particular point, yeah, it would be worth, you know, paying to get somebody to do a trust um, and, uh, and live in trust. And that is something that I would I would like to do. Um, and I know that myself personally, I don't have a trust. I have a will in life insurance, but I know that a trust, a living trust will be the next step. Um, because it's not about me and people who know me well enough know I say that often. It's not about me. It's about others. And so you kind of be, you have to be selfless about that. And, um, you know, I don't have a plot though. I don't know what's going to happen if I die, when I die, <laughs> not if, because I know it's going to happen. It probably won't happen for another hundred years, but. Well, because, you know, th those things can be very pricey, you know, the, oh, yeah. 
you know, the whole headstones and the, the plot and all that. And then two, you know, you want to try to create, you know, a space where all of your family members, if possible, can be buried, sure. um, you know, in the same area. And so if you buy those way ahead of time, you might be able to make that happen. If you give me a Charlie Brown tree, that might work. Just burying next to a Charlie Brown tree, the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine that the branch is still falling off and stuff I'm like arg, you know but um yeah no I, that's something i do have to think about because hmm so see even even now even on the podcast i have something i have to think about but these are things that i do think about uh, maybe not all the time but there are things that i do think about you know like what is the next step you know because it doesn't like i said you can't take your money with you you can't take your debt with you, you can't take your cars you can't take your house your clothes but you can make a decision that can definitely you know impact your children's life and you know if you play your cards right you know maybe your your children's children are able to enjoy that so the houses that we have you know um you know hopefully you know if we don't want to moving or whatever the case may be and stuff you know maybe our descendants can come back and say hey this is our home um because i know that you know my family's from louisiana and mississippi um i don't know about the louisiana side but i know the mississippi side they don't own their land then that are you know when we go to the land it's it's no longer in their possession you know um because uh, if i recall right the deed was the deed was signed way back in the day and so uh you know so when so the original owner let the duncan family stay on the land but then after the owner died we never had the asset, the land transferred to us. So it was really a lot of land in Mississippi. And so, you know, when they, when we had a family reunion, they said, hey, we got to go to the land and whatnot. So we went there and we looked at it and we looked right through this gate. But, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, this is where the Duncans were and stuff. But the, the moral of the story was, it's no longer our land. And so it just winds up being something that sounds great for like an Oprah movie or something like that. But, you know, just imagine if we would have had that land. You know, um, in or just even other situations, I think about my grandmother on my dad's side, um, when, you know, when she died, you know, rather than selling the house, you know, what happened if we kept the house and then, you know, the house got rehabbed, the house in that particular area, you know, at the time that she passed, it was worth 80000 And I know that maybe two years after she had passed and it got sold, or two years after it got sold, um, the house was valued at almost $400,000. Wow. So, I mean, so you think about the larger piece of the pie, the residuals, if you rented it out or whatever the case may be, could have helped provided some additional income um, automatically generated from the estate itself. And so, um, so it doesn't matter if you have a, a $90,000 house, doesn't matter if you have a $900,000 house, it doesn't matter if you have a $400,000 house or a $200,000 house. If you do have if you do own your home and you have a mortgage on your home, um, have a plan to prepare and keep it, you know, because we love our children, we love our grandchildren, and we want the best for them. And we have to consider, you know, in the afterlife, you know, how they're going to be taken care of. So um, that's basically my little comments on that particular piece. Yeah. And, and I just want to add that we can't just make these decisions in our children's and grandchildren's favor. We also have to talk to our children. We have to educate them right. on what decisions have been made and why. And, you know, like you said, Dr. Duncan, just uh, your son knowing what needs to happen, what he would need to do in the event that, um, so that they understand the process because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do all these things and put these things in place, but no one even knows that they're in place or how to access them. That is true. That I'm glad that you said that and stuff. So it can't be no big, large secret, you know, and, and then kind of like on a TV show that somebody has to go to the secret room and stuff and somebody's right there and it's like, and here's the will, you know, no, we should, we should have those conversations, you know, have those conversations with your children as early and often as possible, even if they don't even care at the time or pay attention, at least, you know, like you said, Carmel, about your situation with your mom, um, you know, just being present in the moment you know, because you never realize and stuff that that conversation, how it could kick in when that situation comes about, about how to conduct your affairs, you know, so, um, you know, if you do, for those who do decide to go through a will online, um, or, you know, you know, pay to get a, a will maker, whatever the case may be, you know, read your state laws. Um, so your states might, some states might require you to notarize it, right? So you might have to notarize it. Um, some states may require you to file it with the county or with the state, 
you know, but, you know, those are something that you can look up on your own. You can Google and see the requirements. As a matter of fact, a, a older friend of mine, I actually did his will. And I know for the state of Missouri, oh, Lord, I forgot. It's, it's been a year and some change since I did it. But he had to have two different entities not related to two different people not related to him or who was going to be a beneficiary to sign it. And they had to be notarized in Missouri, whereas Illinois, going off the top of my head, you can notarize it. You know, I notarized it just to play it safe, you know, to show that it actually was, you know, signed or perform, you know, performed and signed and executed before a notary. And I have a copy uh, for myself. And then I also have uh, my, uh, the executors of my state, you know, they have copies of it as well. You know, so that, you know, that, that way they know. And then my children, they know exactly where to go. Um, hopefully they remember, but at least it's a big folder that says legal wills and documents. But um, they'll be able to find out exactly what my advanced directors are, especially if anything would happen to me or their mother. Um, and we're both not in a condition to, you know, make the decisions for our general well being. So, um, you know, like I said, it's, you know, Black excellence, you know, the shirt that I got on is really important and it's really, it's really people excellence, you know, but, you know, it's like I told some people over the last couple of weeks, we have a moral obligation to try to educate, you know, in, in a form, you know, others who look like us and stuff because, you know, we're very, you, we can't be truly successful if we're not able to share the success with others, you know, um, and it really makes a big difference. And so I know that uh, we're going to cut it short a little bit early today. Um, cause I know that we have some other things to do. We wanted to make sure that we're being conscious and committed to doing podcasts on a regular basis. So it'll be at least every other week. Um, we won't do it this next other week because on the 22nd, so on the 22nd, which will be three weeks from now, we're going to definitely have a, a panel discussion on black for black history month. And we're going to talk about black wall street and it's going to be, you know, myself, queen Carmel, uh, Butler, um, you know, we'll talk about financial wealth and kind of add to this particular conversation. And then we're going to have a past guest and uh, a, a current collaborator, Deva Booty Graham. Um, she'll be on there too. And, uh, you know, so at her perspective, you know, and it's just going to be really, you know, fun to, to try to really get, keep this energy going, you know, because 22, what to do. Um, we made some strides in 20 and we've had some heartache in 21, but 22, I think this is more of the year that we start our empowerment and, you know, we can't rely on nobody else but ourselves to take things by the reins and be aggressive with it because uh, there's a, you know, I know Carmel, I know you do with mental health um, regularly, you know, you turn on the TV and you just see just all this, these bad things are happening at a faster pace, you know, um, you know, like this, uh, the guy who, who shot a shot at, shoot at his uh, a seven month old baby in a car because him and a girlfriend, because you know, a girlfriend didn't want his ex-girlfriend didn't want to stay with him, you know, um, you know, you have these kids doing the things that they're doing. Um, at an earlier and earlier age, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing like the way that we was when we were, you know, kids growing up, or, you know, people that we knew that was growing up in certain environments. I mean, this is getting really out of control. And, you know, the reality is, is that if we don't try to intervene, you know, we're going to be a lost generation. Um, and we're going to wind up losing a lot of the gains that we've made over the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah, absolutely. That right there was golden. Thank you for sharing that. Because, you know, basically what I hear you saying is something that I was thinking earlier that uh, people need to understand when we're talking about generational wealth and financial literacy is that our values and our habits are just as important as the financial aspect, because that's what shapes uh, whether or not we're able to create that um, financial literacy and not only financial literacy, but like I said, just that wealth to be able to pass it on to future generations. So values, what are your values? You know, what do you value? And just know that whatever you value, that will create the picture for your daily habits and your daily habits will create the picture for your future and the future of uh, generations to come after you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as the year goes on, we're going to continue to talk about these difficult issues. You know, we need to talk, we need to talk about things that are more reflective in reality. Um, because, 
you know, as I said, some of us have been very fortunate during this pandemic, and there's a lot of people who have not, and there's a lot of people who struggled, a lot of people dealing with a lot of rage, anger, heartbreak, um, loss, grieving, and um, those are silent voices that are not being um, able to emote, and, you know, sometimes the lack of emoting uh, creates action, negative action. And so, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to talk about some issues, some of them going to be difficult. Um, and but we're going to we're going to do it out of, you know, the passion and love for what we do and out of the passion and love that's in our heart. So um, definitely looking for therapy moments with the queen, you know, so we definitely need to, you know, get that on tap, as well as uh, other topics, too. So, you know, we're going to have a nice balance um, throughout the year. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, five people or 5,000 that said that before, you know, if we're able to touch somebody, we've made a difference. And that's matters more than anything else. Um, so uh, any closing thoughts, Queen, before you get ready for this winter storm? No, not apocalypse. really. <laughs> I know, the snowpocalypse, the yeah. ice apocalypse. Yeah. You know, no, not, not really anything of, of significance. Just, you know, take care of yourselves and take care of your loved ones and check in on each other. We forget that. Like, we say that, but do we truly do it? And do we understand the importance, like you said a little bit ago, there's a lot of stuff happening around us. People are dying. People are getting ill. You know, a lot's going on. And we have to make sure that we truly are saying or we, that we're doing what we're saying. We're not just saying things. We're not just repeating cliches and such. Yes. Life is more than a TikTok and a meme. You know, I, sometimes I get memes and little sayings and stuff. And I say, you know, those are cute and stuff. But, you know, by the end of the day, you know, we can have our, you know, we can hit our our highs, our lows, and that's right. And we can agree with it and stuff. But once you kind of look at it, I mean, it's a fleeting moment. So what are we going to do in the between time? So, you know, I, I try to make sure that nowadays to keep myself as uh, grounded as possible. You know, I enjoy the things that I enjoy and I may not like the things I don't like, but I try to make sure that, you know, I stay away from the extremes and stuff and kind of keep my eyes on the prize because it's a long way to go. Like I said, I plan to be here for another hundred years. <laughs> I, I ain't going nowhere no time soon, but I, you know, who knows, but, um, you know, but for the time that I have on this earth, you know, and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with me, anything like that, but I have that mindset and stuff. So I'm just going to enjoy it, you know, enjoy every day. Like it's my last from here on out. And, um, you know, and even if I go through a really rough patch, you know, you know, this all could be taken away from me, you know, cause it is something really stupid. You never know. And if I did, you know, then I would have to learn from that just as much as I, try to celebrate for my success you know and that's the beauty of life we just don't know so with that said if you're in the st louis area hopefully you are able to get to the store on time winkity wink 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 um because you know they're predicting that uh you know like the whole interstates are going to be buried in snow or something like that but we'll see you know how st louis weather is and stuff they'll say seven inches and be one inch and then it'll be like 13 inches you know, or something like that, but you never know. But either way, the kids are out of school tomorrow. So enjoy the time with your kids. And and um, I guess that concludes for tonight. So today is the first day of Black History Month, the shortest month in the year. And we still are stuck with the shortest month of the year, but we're going to make it as memorable as possible and stuff because we celebrate Black History every day and we don't need a month for all that. So yeah. For that said, this is Dr. Duncan and Queen Karma Brown on Mahogany Thoughts on February the 1st, and we are out. See ya. All right. Bye-bye.